Uh, Leo Daly is a legend in his uh, own lifetime. And uh, he shows that uh, those who are in the deep interiors of a country uh, can also be extraordinarily engaged internationally. It's uh, part fact, part myth that in the United States, uh, people on the two coasts, uh, the Atlantic coast and the uh, Western coast of California, Washington and Oregon, that these are the more internationally engaged and involved with regard to trade and investment and technology cooperation. But not so in the case of uh, Leo Daly. Uh, it's a, a two generation family of designers and architects literally hundreds of uh, architects and designers. I've met a number of them uh, who've been involved in uh, basic major infrastructure uh, projects in the Eastern Arab world that have uh, profoundly uh, modernized and transformed uh, these economies in the development uh, direction. Uh, Leo Daly. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, my dear friend, Dr. John Duke Anthony, ladies and gentlemen watching from all over the world, I am pleased and proud to serve as a member of the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations International Advisory Committee, where I volunteer to advance the National Council's important educational work building bridges of understanding between the United States and the Arab world. The organization's work is needed more now than ever. I am personally delighted with the Council's educational efforts. This nonprofit organization needs your support and generosity to continue making a difference, especially during this time of the pandemic. The National Council is very pleased you have joined us and we hope you enjoy not only this online virtual session right now, but all the carefully planned presentations this week during the Council's annual conference. We are especially looking forward to Prince Turkey Al Faisal's remarks today. Thank you. I have wonderful memories of Prince Turkey over the years here in Washington and in the kingdom. He and his family have done so much for Saudi Arabia's international relationships while also enhancing the quality of life in Saudi Arabia, including in the areas of health and education. Prince Turkey works tirelessly to advance his country's interests and push forward the enormous changes and opportunities we are all witnessing taking place in Saudi Arabia. I first met Prince Turkey when I was, when I began traveling to the kingdom in the very early 1970s. Um, it, was a, it was a very early time for the cities and the, and the, the whole system. Our architectural engineering firm was awarded a vast, secure $200 million military complex with a state-of-the-art underground operations center hardened against blast. Just outside of Riyadh, uh, was, it was located. Our client was the Saudi Arabian National Guard, headed by the Crown Prince Abdullah. This first project led to our firm's 50-year presence in the Middle East with, and hundreds of completed projects. Crown Prince Abdullah also introduced me to Razi al Ghosebi, the Minister of Industry and Electricity, which led to another significant outcome. He was a great advocate of further education. Al Ghosebi proposed that we collaborate to develop a graduate intern program for young Saudi architects and engineers. We formed the Saudi Consulting House slash Leoy Daly and trained over a hundred young professionals in our Omaha headquarters and later in our Riyadh office building. I'm very proud of our many graduates that went on to hold key position in the Saudi government. Which brings me to my first meeting with Princess Rima. Prince Turkey's sister, 
excuse me, Prince Turkey's sister is Princess Haifa bin Faisal al Saud, who is Prince Bandar's wife and Princess Rima's mother. One day, when I was visiting Prince Bandar uh, at an army base near Riyadh in his prefabricated uh, home there, I met Princess Rima. She was playing with other children on the floor in the living room of the house. I found her very smart and charming even then. Who could have guessed that this very accomplished George Washington University graduate would be the first woman ambassador named by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? We'll look forward to hearing from her tomorrow while learning from her uncle today. In conclusion, please enjoy these three sessions convened by the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations, marking their 29th conference. We are, we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to hear from so many specialists, and we look forward to hopefully being together next fall for the Council's annual gathering marks its third decade, 30 years. Thank you, Prince Turkey, for joining us, and thank you for everyone else for tuning in. Dr. Anthony, I'm I'm turning the, I'm passing the baton back to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daly. Thank you for your support and for the continuity of your uh, family's leadership and in innovation and creativity and the arts, humanities, and social sciences at the same time, enhancing the well being, material well being, and the standard of living of peoples uh, throughout. Uh, much of the world, not just in the uh, so-called developing world, we're all developing, none of us are fully developed uh, there, but you particularly focused on the Arab East and your relationship with the uh, ruling families, not just of Saudi Arabia, but the other monarchies in the region is, is, is profound. There are none other uh, like the Leo Daly uh, Corporation. We're lucky to have you as a friend and as one of our supporters. It's now my privilege uh, and honor and pleasure to introduce uh, a friend, someone I've admired for a long time. Uh, we are both uh, alumni of uh, Georgetown uh, University here in the, in the nation's uh, capital. Uh, His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Turkey El Faisal, uh, uh, Ben Abdulaziz, Ben Abdurrahman El Saud, uh, is the chairman of the King Faisal uh, Foundation and Center for uh, Islamic Studies and, and Research. Uh, this foundation uh, is uh, a one of a kind, certainly in the Arab region, the Middle East and the Islamic world. Uh, every year for quite some time now, it has uh, been the equivalent of, uh, of an Arab Nobel Prize uh, institution uh, that annually uh, combs the face of the earth to find uh, outstanding uh, scientists and technicians and those in technology, especially in health, uh, as well as in culture and civilization. There's, there's no other center like it. It's based in Riyadh. Uh, any of you who visit Riyadh are encouraged to go to it. It's, it's unpretentious. You might uh, drive by it many a time and wonder what is that building there that has a, a circular uh, circumference uh, uh, to its structure and uh, in the shape of a pen, a fountain pen or an ink pen because of knowledge. And the Al Faisal family, uh, uh, Turkey Al Faisal and his sisters and brothers have carried on the tradition of his mother and his father. I was privileged uh, to have met his uh, father uh, uh, before uh, he became uh, king uh, in Saudi Arabia as well as in uh, Washington. And uh, Prince Turkey has been a fixture of these policymaker conferences now for uh, more than a decade. Uh, each year, by popular demand, he has graciously cleared his scheduled and return to share his thoughts, his insights, his information, his knowledge, his understanding, his analysis, his prognostications, and his uh, assessments of 
uh, trends and indications that are of immense importance to policymakers in particular, but also with regard to decision makers. Those who are involved with uh, helping to formulate a country's policies and positions, its actions and its attitudes, all look to and look up to uh, His Royal Highness. And why? Beyond the educational credentials that he brings to the task. Uh, for more than a quarter of a century, he headed uh, the Kingdom's uh, General Intelligence Directorate, uh, more or less the equivalent of the uh, American uh, Central Intelligence Agency or the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, was the equivalent of Saudi Arabia's General Intelligence uh, Directorate. A position like this uh, uh, requires uh, multiple facets that uh, elude most people in terms of their character, uh, particularly in terms of honesty, in terms of dignity, in terms of trust, in terms of respect, in terms of erudition. Uh, these are things that a person is not born with, but is schooled with, and uh, their parents uh, serve as role models, as did Prince uh, Turkey's parents. Very few people uh, alive today um, are the children or part of the progeny of the parents that uh, His Royal Highness says. The university and gender, uh, Queen Ifat uh, University, is named after his uh, uh, late uh, mother, Queen Ifat, Allah uh, Yehama, uh, uh, rest her uh, soul. And with regard to his diplomatic assignments, uh, was posted to the Court of St. James in the United Kingdom. Uh, Saudi Arabia's relationship with Great Britain is at times um, more extensive, deeper, more varied, and certainly historically longer than its relationship with the United States and it's unbroken there. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a film that I hope that many of you can see that Prince Turkey uh, was involved with, and it's called uh, Born a King. And it is a, a documentary, quasi-documentary, superbly performed, choreographed, and acted uh, largely in Great Britain. Uh, the story of his uh, late father, Allah Yehimu, uh, when he was a boy and sent by his father uh, uh, to uh, have the Court of St. James and the government of Great Britain to recognize Saudi Arabia as a nationally sovereign politically independent and territorially intact uh, kingdom and country. And that family uh, has been part of the founding of the United Nations. His father was present at the founding of it, uh, the, uh, present at the founding of the League of Arab States, the world's oldest regional organization committed to addressing regional challenges, issues, and conflicts through diplomacy, uh, law, and peaceful uh, of mechanisms. From Great Britain, he became ambassador to the United States of, of America. And he's also been uh, deeply engaged in the Arab uh, Thought Foundation, the Moasis of Fikra Arab, uh, their uh, conglomerate of uh, Arab intellectuals from Morocco to Muscat, Baghdad to Berber, Algiers to Aden. Alexandria and Aleppo uh, in between. Uh, he's also been a patron of the Beirut uh, Institute uh, summits uh, headed by Ragida uh, Dirhan, uh, uh, from whom we'll hear more uh, before this conference uh, uh, terminates. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, anxiously uh, a friend, a supporter, uh, someone we admire and respect beyond more than words can say. His Royal Highness at Prince Turkey, El Faisal, El Saud. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anthony. I'd like also to thank Mr. John Pratt, the chairman of the council, as well as Leo Daly, a longtime friend and uh, wonderful host, not only at the council, but in his home. I've uh, had the pleasure of, of uh, having a meal there when I was ambassador in Washington. And my also, my thanks go to the staff of the, of the council and their colleagues for their efforts in organizing this event at such a difficult time. Uh, 
Pat Mancino, of course, is the dynamo that makes these things happen. Thank you, Pat. Ladies and gentlemen, at a time when the world is facing its most critical crisis that is claiming thousands of lives every day worldwide, we're learning firsthand how much is the oneness of our human destiny is. Uh, COVID-19 proved beyond any doubt the importance of multilateralism in dealing with our common enemies and the importance of humility and cooperation between nations for success in facing our global challenges. A brief report, ladies and gentlemen, on where the kingdom is in this turbulent year. A King Salman chairs the G20 summit, which will convene in four days. He already held an extraordinary meeting last July via cyberspace because of the advent of the coronavirus pandemic. This malign and ugly, lifeless invader continues to take its toll on humanity. Hopefully, the vaccines under development will stop it, if not eradicate it. The kingdom took exceptional measures to combat this disease, which brought down the number of daily cases from over 1,500 in the summer to under 400, and the percentage of deaths recorded is one of the lowest in the world. This record has been shared with our G20 partners as well as with the rest of the world, and King Salman's call on his fellow leaders of the G20 to give special attention to the poorer countries led them to agree to reduce the debt burden of those countries as well as other aid contributions to help them and also to provide financial help for them to meet the pandemic. During the G20 meetings, the members also agreed to the Saudi proposal on the carbon circular economy, which aims not only to reduce carbon emissions, but also to use carbon for constructive purposes. The kingdom also announced its development of hydrogen as an addition to the other alternative energy sources. We are building the largest hydrogen produ production facility in the world with an American company. Of course, the pandemic also brought havoc to oil prices, bringing them down to $20 per barrel. Fortunately, the kingdom convinced the OPEC members and other producers to cut production and stabilize the price of oil. It is now in the mid forties. The US was a major contributor, contributor to this development and President Trump's calls with President Putin and King Salman helped reach a deal. While we all hope for a quick return to normalcy after defeating this global pandemic, the world expects that the next American administration will take the lead in emphasizing the consolidation of multilateralism and reforming its institutions to deal effectively with such an immense challenge and future ones. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a fact that the people in many parts of our region have watched the American elections as if they were their own. However, many have been seeing that their high expectations were always disappointed by the conduct of the successive American administrations regarding issues of their concern, particularly when it comes to the just Palestinian issue. I hope they will not be disappointed this time. It is not enough to keep repeating the fact that the Arab world and the greater Middle East are troubled regions. However, the Middle East nowadays is not only troubled, but it is in a state of strategic confusion. This state of confusion, though not exclusive to the Middle East, is contributing immensely to the continuation of and escalation of conflicts and the deepening state of uncertainty. It is also creating new conflicts that complicate the situation in a region where every crisis begets another crisis and where every issue is linked to another issue. In such a situation, it is exceedingly difficult to anticipate the implications of the new presidency for the big picture in the troubled Middle East. President-elect Joseph Biden is not new to politics. He is an experienced statesman and well familiar with the important issues in the world and in our region. However, we must wait to see, to know about his vision, his team, and his foreign policy conduct. While his speeches, statements, and especially his article, Why America Must Lead Again, early this year in Foreign Affairs magazine, may give us an indication of his thinking, but it all depends on his actions. I hope that he will echo himself. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has worked with all American administrations, Democrat and Republican, 
And while we have had our differences, nonetheless, both countries have maintained the strategic alliance that bound us to a common goal. That goal is a peaceful and prosperous Middle East, world peace and the betterment of humanity. Assuring the world of US leadership and commitments is an imperative in such a historic strategy. This is especially important to all regions of the world, not only the Middle East. We all know that the world is on the verge of a major structural transformation in world and regional power configurations. I have been reiterating through the years from this venue and other venues that there is no more cause for suspicion and discord than the uncertainty about American strategic outlook towards the Middle East. For the last seven decades, Middle East geopolitics revolved around a security architecture managed by the United States. Therefore, the perception of the US abandoning the region and its commitments there is feeding this uncertainty and this strategic confusion in the Middle East. In fact, the real danger remains a putative American retrenchment from the area, which widens the, existence, the existing strategic vacuum that is increasingly coveted by regional and other great powers. This imagined perception increases the appetite of radical states and forces in the region to make it real, which harms American national interests and its allies and friends. Strategic confusion in the Middle East means a state of mistrust, sharp polarization, multiplicity of issues of conflicts, and multiplicity of competing actors dealing with the situation on an ad hoc basis. This situation is responsible for unleashing all kinds of political, social, religious, sectarian, non-state actors, terrorist groupings, and regional and international interferences. While it is fair to say that the US foreign policy in the Middle East during the reign of the past three administrations contributed immensely to this state of affairs, states of the region also bear a big share of responsibility for where things stand today. However, the new administration has a responsibility in dealing the, the region to a different, in leading the region to a different atmosphere. President-elect Joe Biden has stated on many occasions and in his article mentioned previously that he would rejoin the JCPOA of 2015 with Iran if Tehran returns to strict compliance with the deal. In his words, and I quote, I would rejoin the agreement and use our renewed commitment to diplomacy to work with our allies to strengthen and extend it while more effectively pushing back against Iran's other destabilizing activities. While we all aspire to have Iran back as a normal peaceful nation state within the international community, the last 40 years experience with Iran's regime is not encouraging. Therefore, rejoining the deal as it is would not do service to stability in our region. Rejoining and then negotiating the other important issues would trap diplomacy and subject it to Iranian blackmailing. Drag negotiations is a part of Iranian negotiating strategies. Negotiating the JCPOA took years to be accomplished while Iran worked on its nuclear program. Mr. President-elect, do not repeat the mistakes and shortcomings of the first deal. Any non-comprehensive deal will not achieve lasting peace and security in our region. The JCPOA did not rationalize Iranian destructive behavior in our region. Iranian destructive regional behavior in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia by attacking directly and indirectly the oil installations is as much a threat as is its nuclear program. Therefore, there is a need to a new agreement that encompasses all issues of concern with Iran. Another issue in this respect is do not ignore the legitimate concerns of your friends and allies in the region. They must be part of negotiating, negotiating a comprehensive plan to be ensured that their strategic interests are not taken in, in consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, with every new president in the United States, the hope arises that the US will honor its commitment to solving the Palestinian issue justly. It is the hope that the new administration will adhere to UN resolutions regarding the two-state solution. In his address to the Consultative Assembly a few days ago, King Salman reiterated the kingdom's long-standing support for a sovereign Palestinian state with its capital in East Jerusalem as predicated in the Arab Peace Initiative. 
ladies and gentlemen, you do not treat a bleeding wound by giving a sedative. The situations in Iraq and Syria require the attention of this new administration. After long troubled years, Iraqis are longing to reclaim their national state and their national institutions, and they deserve to be helped not to be abandoned. Having a stable and secure Iraq is in the interest of all in the Arab world and the rest of the world. The national Iraqi state is especially important in restoring the balance of power in the region and to curtail the malign and destructive tendencies coming from Iran. The same can be said about the Syrian state that is tragically suffering for the last 10 years. Leaving it to Iran and Russia and Turkey does not help the Syrian people to realize their aspirations. Therefore, a U.S. role is needed to push for a peaceful end to this catastrophe. The U.S.-GCC countries' relationship is imperative to peace and stability in the region. Therefore, bilateral and multilateral relations are always steady and well-preserved by both parties, regardless of difficulties that arise every now and then. Strategic partnerships between these countries and the U.S. are pillars of their conduct. I am confident that the new administration will not be different from the previous administrations regarding these important relationships. Common interests are the main drivers of this relationship, preserving regional stability, stability of energy markets, opposition to revolutionary Iran and its regional behavior, peace in the Middle East, fighting terrorism, and investment and trade are the basics of this strategic relationship. I remind us that when King Salman visited President Obama in 2015, both leaders committed themselves to these issues. As a matter of fact, the statement coming out of the two leaders themselves mentioned all of these concerns. King Salman accepted President Obama's assurances that the JCPOA will prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. The statement goes on to affirm the need to continue efforts to maintain security, prosperity, and stability in the region, and in particular to counter Iran's destabilizing activities. On Yemen, the two leaders stressed the need to implement relevant UN Security Council resolutions, including the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2216, in order to facilitate a political solution based on the GCC initiative and the outcomes of the national dialogue. Regarding the Palestinian conflict, the two leaders underscored the enduring importance of the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative and underlined the necessity of reaching a comprehensive, just and lasting settlement to the conflict based on two states living side by side in peace and prosperity. The statement ends by saying that the two leaders discussed a new strategic partnership between the two countries for the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, since that case, the statement came out, Iran's destabilizing activities have increased, as I mentioned before. And those who ask us to unilaterally abandon the legitimate government of Yemen to the Houthis have only to consider that the Houthis are not Boy Scouts. They are a murderous cutthroat cult directed by Iran, which supplies them with drones and ballistic missiles that they launch against Saudi and Yemeni civilian targets. Mr. Biden, when the statement came out, was the Vice President of the United States. In congratulating President-elect Biden for his election, King Salman, the custodian of the two holy mosques, and his Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, emphasized the importance of the historical relationship between the two countries and expressed their readiness to continue their strategic partnership with the US. This 75-year-old relationship is bigger than the personalities that built it and invested in it for the good of the two countries during the last long year, during those long years. I hope that members of your legislative chambers will not take precipitous action that will do harm to this relationship. They should visit the kingdom and see for themselves the progress we made on all the issues of concern whether it is the rights of women, the fight against extremism, or any other issues. As far as human rights are concerned, we admit that we have issues to improve, and we're working on that. It is a work in progress. But respectfully, your country also 
has issues of human rights to improve upon. Witness the turmoil during your elections and the police shootings. We ladies and gentlemen did not invent waterboarding. Your issues are also a work in progress. And I am sure that we can both learn from our experiences. Your elections are a wonderful spectacle from which we can learn. They also include elements which we will not learn. But our hearts and our doors are open for you. Please come and see us. Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, uh, thank you once again for your uh, tour de force, uh, tour de horizon. I don't know why we still use French words uh, for what uh, can equally be conversed in Arabic or, or in English there, but you covered the, the waterfront with regard to Iran and Palestine and Yemen and extremism, as well as the bilateral relationship uh, between our two countries and what each can learn from the other uh, with a substantial uh, dose of humility on, on both sides there and a deep seated aversion to extremism of any kind, shape or, or form. 